thank you for blessing your word today and revelation knowledge and open their hearts to hear it. Radio, TV, internet, congregation, Lord, thanks for your spirit to guide us. Yeah, this is uh, 12 letters of the Hebrew alphabet that's in your bulletin. And uh, you can get these, messiahcomes.com. And uh, there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And last week we were, each one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet at uh, messiah.com.es. Uh, you can get this. And um, I'm still want to do the whole alphabet sooner or later. And last week we started with Redeemer. That's number two there, the Hebrew alphabet, uh, number two, uh, second letter there. And in, in, in uh, Isaiah 59, 20, it says, The Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them who turn from transgression in Jacob. Now the Expositor Bible says, The Redeemer is Christ and will come to Zion. And Paul quoted this in uh, Romans eleven twenty six. All the transgressions mentioned in verse 12 of this uh, chapter in corresponding scripture will now be finally be brought to the Redeemer. Then Jacob will finally become Israel, the prince of God. So notice the Redeemer shall come to Zion. He came 2,000 years ago. He's coming again. Really, it can come any time now. But first of all, say that we're answering the question, who is the Messiah? Now, who is the Messiah in this verse? The Redeemer, right? Say, the Messiah, Messiah. is the Redeemer, the Redeemer, according to Isaiah 59, 20. And then secondly, we learn, if you go back to Isaiah 9, go back to Isaiah 9, we'll do a little review now. Sometimes people tell me I go so fast, but I get so excited I can't help it. <laughs> Isaiah 9. Uh, 6 through 7. In this uh, verse, Christ is, in this promise, as he is um, the son of David. That's the third letter of the Hebrew alphabet there that we have on our handout. In Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, notice, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David. Now, he is of the lineage of King David. That's what that means, of the throne of David. He's the lineage of King David. And it notice it says, Of his peace there shall be no end, and of his government there shall be no end upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment, justice, from henceforth and forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So notice again that he is the son of David. Okay, I've got to keep moving. Also, if we look in Psalm 89, 27, turn your Bible, Psalm 89, 27. Psalm 89, we're... we're finding out who the Messiah is, and this broadcast goes into Israel. So I want you to follow along in the Law of the Prophets and the Psalms to find out who your Messiah is because it's very plain in your Scripture who He is. Jesus Christ, whom so far you've rejected, is the only one that fulfills all of these Old Testament prophecies out of your law, prophet, and psalms. He's the only one that fulfills these. Nobody else has ever done it. You've been looking for 2,000 years, haven't found anybody that would fulfill these prophecies. Well, Jesus Christ of Nazareth came to you to save you, and He's still reaching out His nail-scarred hands today, dripping blood to save you from your sins, and to receive you unto himself so that you won't have to go through the, through the tribulation period. Okay, let's see. Um, 80, Psalm 89, verse 27. Notice this. Let's do 26. He shall cry unto me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. 
that David refers to the Lord three, uh, but three titles, Father, God, and Rock of Salvation. But you know, Jesus referred to his Father. Uh, he always called him Father. He always called him Father, not God. He said Father. And notice what the Father says to him. I will make him my firstborn higher than all the kings of the earth. So see, Jesus became God's firstborn son. He's only begotten son. So that's another important description of the Messiah. He'll be the firstborn of God. Okay, moving right along here. Uh, we, we learned last time in Isaiah 53, 3 through 5, that he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He didn't come as a king in a palace and shielded from all the harshness of life, all the battles that we go through. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and his heart is still broken today because of all those who reject him, turn from him. They have no mention now in the public square of anything that has to do with his birth because that uh, seems to be outlawed now or looked down upon and his name, they don't want his name mentioned, even the chaplains, you know, in their prayers, they said, no, that's, uh, uh, you're messing with the establishment clause and separation of church and state, which of course is a lie. There's no such thing in our constitution it has to do with, with uh, separation of church and state, especially separation from God and state is what they're after. Separation from God and there's no such thing because our forefathers loved Jesus, loved, Jesus, loved God and it's right in our founding documents. So um, he was to be the firstborn son of God. He uh, judge of all nations. Uh, look at Psalm 110. Just go over a few, a few uh, chapters. Psalm 110, verse five and six. Psalm 110, verse five and six. Okay. Uh, notice here, if you start here. In, in verse 2, the Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be willing in the day of your power. Now see, God is going to make people willing. The Jews and the Gentiles, they're going to be willing in the day of His power because He has the power to do that and multitudes are going to be turning toward, to Him you know, in the, uh, the, as, as Michael was prophesying there in the last days in there in Joel, there's still that great revival to come, and I believe it's already started, and Israel is going to be turning to the Lord. Uh, uh, Romans says, all Israel shall be saved. And notice that this is an important scripture. Your people shall be willing in the day of your power. See, the more His Spirit is poured out, the stronger His Spirit gets, the more people will be willing to serve Him. I mean, this is a powerful scripture, and I got, it, I got it circled here. Your people shall be willing in the day of your power, in the beauty of wholeness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. And notice here, we're talking about Melchizedek um, and their offering. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Not Aaron Melchizedek. He was a type of Christ there in Genesis. So God says here, and that's another uh, point here in, in, the, um, in, the, in these letters um, down at the bottom there, the second one on the bottom row, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, and that's a Hebrew letter there for it. And uh, notice the Lord at your right hand which shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. That's the battle of Armageddon when he'll come back again at the end of it. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the place with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. See, those nations that reject him, he's not coming back at, at this time in, uh, you know, in humility. He's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. And those who reject him, they will be gone because it says he's going to strike through kings in the day of his wrath. Um, so it's, it's very important to know Jesus as Savior so you won't have to know him as your judge. That's really important. Okay, I've got to keep moving because I've got a, a world of information here for you. I want to... Okay, and then uh, uh, um, the next one in, in Genesis 14, 17 through 20, 
In Psalm 110, verse 4, he's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So uh, I just want to make sure that, that you see that. Okay. Um, in Zechariah 9, 9. Now, Zechariah, thank you, Lord, turn right. It's right at the, uh, near the end of the Old Testament. Look at this. Uh, you and Israel that are listening, Zechariah 9, 9. We're asking you to identify who your Messiah is with an open mind and not what you've been told by your family or priests or whoever it was. Just follow the old, not, I'm sorry, follow the law, the prophet, and the Psalms to find out who your Messiah really is. And here's another important scripture that will identify who your Messiah really is and who our Messiah is. Uh, Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes unto you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon a donkey and upon a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, the, the expositors points out this scripture pertains to the first advent of Christ there's a definite prediction that the Messiah would be the king of the Jews. It's right there. It says, your king comes unto you. It is said, listen to this, it's so good. It is said in this verse, the four gospels appear in this one verse. Four gospels are here. As portrayed in Matthew, he is your king. In Mark, here, he says he's lowly. That's a servant. Mark portrays Jesus as a servant. In Luke, he is just, hence the man. In John, he is God, therefore having salvation. He comes having salvation. He is God, therefore having salvation. He appears as a prince of peace in his first advent, but in his second advent, mounted on a war horse as the mighty conqueror, Revelation chapter 19. Behold, your king comes unto you, refers to Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the first day of the week in which he was crucified. So Jesus fulfilled this when he rode into Jerusalem on the first day, on Monday, of what we call Holy Week, to present himself as king. And of course, in his first advent, he was rejected and died on the cross, as was planned by God, uh, for our sins. So, praise God. Shelby, how am I doing with my time? Okay, I got something really important at the end here I want to give you. I want to make sure I got plenty of time. Okay, um, let's see. I can keep moving here then. Okay, let's see. Um, Isaiah 41, one, uh, Isaiah 4, I think. Let me see. Isaiah 4, 1 through 5. Let's check that out. Let's see if I can read my own writing. Isaiah 4. Isaiah 4, okay, um, this is talking about uh, the Messiah reigning. Let's look at this. In, in, in uh, verse 2 of Isaiah 4, In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent, and comely from those who are escaped of Israel. So uh, the Messiah, one through five here, if you study that out, it says that he comes from the stump of Jesse. You know, Jesse was David's father, and Jesus came through the lineage of, of, of David. So he's a stump from the root of Jesse. And so this is another prophecy, the branch of the Lord, that he fulfills. Okay, um, let's see. He's a shoot from the stump of Jesse and Isaiah 40, verse 11. Go to Isaiah 40 real quick, verse 11. I want to get as many of these in as I can because Isaiah 40, uh, verse 11, it says, I love this one. The Hebrew letter here is that he is the arm of the Lord. Isaiah 40, verse 11. And let's start at 10. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand. His arm shall rule for him. 
His reward is with him. His work is before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those who are with young. So he carries us throughout our lives. He carries us. He loves us. Uh, one of the greatest memories of my childhood when I come up to grandma and granddad's on the weekends, I would, uh, they would put a couch beside their bed and had this picture of, of the good shepherd Jesus with the lamb in his arms and the sheep all around him. And I looked at that every weekend. I would look at that picture. Jesus as a good shepherd. And back then, a love uh, began to form in my heart for Jesus. And I, I would read his word when I'd come up to Grandma. She had this Bible story book. It was so good. It was an adult Bible story book, but, but it was so good. And I just began to, way back then, just formulate, you know, that Jesus loves me. He cares for me. And uh, he began to stir in my heart. And, of course, you know, he, he led me later on uh, into the ministry. But... but as the arm of the Lord, he has you in his hand. And I think one of the greatest uh, scriptures here is Isaiah 7, 14. I love this scripture, Isaiah 7, 14. And I've been studying this week. It means more to me than ever now. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, what does Emmanuel mean? Okay, let's say it. Emmanuel means God with us. Let's say it again. Emmanuel means God with us. And as I was doing some research on this this week, I tell you, I found some great stuff. I just wanted to share it. it was so good because how we need him to, to be with us. When we accept Christ into our lives, nothing, not even death, can ever separate us from Him again. I think, you know, when you look at this, I think it's the greatest promise in the Bible. Nothing, even death, can separate us from His love. It's what Christmas is all about. God is with us. The great people of faith have always claimed this promise. Remember Moses, when he was leading Israel out of Egypt, and Pharaoh and all of his horsemen, and army was behind Moses, the Red Sea was in front. Moses stretched out that rod and he believed that God was with him and God was and led him through the parted waters. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into the fiery furnace because they wouldn't listen to, to the king of, of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And they believed that God was going to be with them in that fiery furnace and he was, wasn't he? He was uh, the third, the a uh, fourth man in the fire was Jesus. God was with us. When we go through our fiery furnaces, God is with us. Like David before Goliath, man, what chance did a small boy have with a slingshot before giant, uh, this giant Goliath? But David, David said, he said, you know, he, he knew God was with him. And he overcome the giant with that slingshot. Uh, it's interesting to note that in Matthew's gospel, when he wanted to capture the meaning of Christmas, the meaning of the Christ event, the meaning of Jesus in a single word, he did a very wise thing. He reached back into the law of the prophet and the Psalms and pulled out a, a word and dusted it off, Emmanuel, God with us. And you know, when he appeared to Joseph in a dream and, and told uh, him what he should do to get out there and, and save the child, and go into Egypt. But, uh, you know, God is not just the God. He's not just with us in our dreams. Because you know all that happened to Joseph and Mary and Jesus after they, he had this dream. So he's with us when the crushing reality of life and bad things happen and come down upon us. He's there. He's God. He's God with us. Uh, Scott Hosey says, it's so good, and um, you ought to follow the pastor around a few weeks, two or three weeks. You would change your perspective on life entirely. And this was so good because, you know, Iris and I go through this, and Emmanuel is God with us in the cancer clinic and in the Alzheimer's ward at the local nursing home. Emmanuel is God with us when the pink slip comes 
and when the beloved child sneers to its parents, I hate you, he is with us. He's there with us. Uh, Emmanuel is God with us when you pack the Christmas decorations away. And with an aching heart, you realize that your son did not call over the holidays. Not even one time. He's with us in sickness. He's with us in everything that we go through. No matter what it is, he is there. And thank God, you know, I can go into the hospital room, I can go into these Alzheimer's units and I, can, and I tell them because an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and I'll tell them, I say, look, 2 Timothy 1 says that God has not given us the spirit of fear but power and love and a sound mind. God is with you in this Alzheimer's unit yes. and, he, and you have the mind of Christ. He's given you the mind of Christ. You don't have to lose your mind. How can, how can you lose your mind when, when you have the mind of Christ? Is that doesn't agree with, agree with Scripture. And I'll get him to repeat that Scripture about three times. And I'll tell him, you know, this nursing home, this Alzheimer's unit is not your final home. This is not it. I've seen people return back to their own home and, and most of all we get to go to our heavenly home. So whatever the situation is, God is with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. No matter what you go through, just remember the first thing that ought to pop in our minds. God is with us. Let's say it. God is with us. Say it again. God is with us. Let's say it again. God is with us. See, that's the message of Christmas. God is with us. He hadn't forsaken us. He hadn't deserted us. When all these things and all hell breaks loose, what is it? God is, God is with us. And He always will be. You know, we was with a, a brother. Um, uh, I was called to the hospital. Uh, Sue Ann, it was her landlord. And uh, I, didn't know, I didn't know the man. But thank God. You know, she called. And he was in a coma. And, uh, and I went into the room, and I don't ever quit or give up as long as there's breath in their body. I'm going to do everything I can to get them saved. And he, he was a wonderful man, but he'd never gone to church or anything. I don't think he'd ever accepted the Lord. But even in that coma, I went over to his bed and called him by his name. And I said, now, if you, I know you're too weak to respond, but if you'll go through this prayer in your spirit, Jesus will save you. And I led him through that prayer. And I know it was God. I know it was a divine appointment because a day or two later he, he passed out of that body into eternity. And so God was with him. He was perfect health. You know, 80 years old, perfect health. Worked all the time. Just a mighty strong man. The last thing he did was put in this refrigerator and by himself in this complex of young apartments. And, uh, but see, when this body gives out, you have to have divine fuel. You have to have divine breath, a divine heartbeat from that point on or you will pass into a place we don't want to talk about. It's only through Christ. And, and I knew God was with us in that room and his wife grieving, his sister torn apart. I knew that God was there. And I don't go in and just say, oh, you know, this is the way it is. This is life, you know. No, it's not. God is with us no matter what you're going through. And I know a lot of you are going through a lot of stuff. Not just in this congregation, but you're listening and watching. And, and uh, some of you, your wife don't even know who you are anymore. They ask you, who, what is your name? Or, or your mother? Or, well, God is with you. God is with you. He loves you. And He cares about you. And just make sure you do everything you can to, to get the person saved. And everything else will be okay. Uh, ever and always, Jesus stares straight into you with his two good eyes, and he does so not only when you smile back, but almost most certainly when your eyes are full of tears. In fact, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with you, even in the, those times when you're so angry with God that you refuse to look at him in his eyes. But even when you feel like you can't look at him, he never looks away from you, 
He can't look away from you because His name says it all. Emmanuel, God with you. He'll never look away. He'll always be there for you because He loves you. He died for you. And He wants you to be saved. And He wants to spend eternity with you. So I just ask you, you know, just remember, God is with you, and if you've never received Him as Lord and Savior of your life, I ask you to come and give your heart to Jesus at this Christmas season. Here in the congregation, the radio, TV, Internet, just come because He loves you, He's with you, He wants to save you, and He wants to keep you forever, and to take you to eternity with Him when your time comes comes to go. Happy trails to you. It's great to say hello and to share with you the joy I've come to know. It started on the day when I met Jesus. When he comes into the heart, he really frees us to a life that's true. Happy trails to you. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Smile and until then Who cares about the clouds if we're together Just sing a song and bring the sunny weather Happy trails to you Till we meet again some trails are happy ones, others are blue. It's the way you ride the trail that counts. Here's a happy one for you. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Smiling until then Who cares about the clouds if we're together Just sing a song and bring the sunny weather Happy trails to you Till we meet again